Welcome to the Therapy and Prayer Podcast. Here you'll find the intersection between faith and mental health. I'm your host, Camille. I'm a licensed therapist and clinical social worker, but more importantly, I'm a Christian who really loves the Lord. And I'm just trying to navigate this life without falling victim to it, just like everyone else. Here we take a faith-based approach to all things mental health and wellness, because the Bible tells us to guard our heart and mind. And sometimes we need a little bit of help with that. Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to the Therapy and Prayer Podcast. If you're new here, my name is Camille and I'm so happy that you're here. If you're not new, hey, I missed you and I'm glad that you're back. (laughs) I hope that you're having a good week. How was your week? Take a second and think about it. If you haven't already, this this is our midweek check-in. See how you've been doing. Where are you today mentally and emotionally? What do you need moving forward to get through the rest of this week? I am a little bit hoarse. You can probably hear it in my voice, but that's okay. We're going to push through anyway. God put this on my heart and I think it's really important for us to talk about it. And I don't mind when my voice is a little bit raspy. I feel like uh, it's my alter ego a little bit. All right. So if you listened to the episode from a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about self-sabotage and spiritual strongholds. Today, we're going in a similar direction. We're going to be talking about defense mechanisms and spiritual warfare. So if you're not familiar with defense mechanisms, let's let's just start with a general definition to make sure that we're on the same page and have a general understanding. So a defense mechanism is a mental process that's initiated typically unconsciously. So these are not really things that we're very aware of, but it's a mental process that is initiated unconsciously to avoid conflict, threat, or anxiety. So on some level, we're aware that the, we're aware that there is a potential threat, a potential conflict, or something that makes us anxious, and so there is a part of us that goes into defense mode to try to avoid those things. We all want to avoid icky feelings, negative feelings. We all want to avoid being hurt, and so essentially, our defense mechanisms—that uh, is, our brain's way of trying to keep us safe from either a real danger or a perceived danger, something that feels unsafe to us, even though it may not be unsafe. Now, defense mechanisms can be adaptive, meaning they can be healthy because we do need to have some sort of fear response. We do need to have some sort of instincts that kick in when there is a real fear that happens. And sometimes we deal with conflict and things in our life that make us really, really anxious or dysregulated or make us go into a panic. And we do need some ways to kind of come down from that. We need some ways to be able to calm down and move forward. So in that sense, they can be adaptive. They can be really healthy. But It's when our defense mechanisms are not healthy. It's when they are maladaptive. That's when it starts to become a problem. Part of the reason they can be maladaptive is there there are multiple things. You can have maladaptive defense mechanisms that come into play when there is a threat that's not real and factual, but it's perceived based on your thought process, your experience, your trauma, whatever. And another reason, the main reason that some defense mechanisms are maladaptive is that they can be pretty destructive, depending on the ones that you typically lean into. So some of the big ones that we see are distraction, denial, the self-sabotage that we talked about, avoidance, projection, rationalization, all of that. Those are the unhealthy or maladaptive defense mechanisms. Some of the healthier ones, we call those coping skills, really. So we don't really talk about them in the same terminology, but some things that can be healthy to help us work through those moments of anxiety are journaling, uh, mindfulness, getting out in nature, talking to a loved one, taking some time to meditate, things that help you uh, to, to learn, things that can pour into you, things that help you feel better. Well, not necessarily just to help you that help you feel better because sometimes the maladaptive ones help you feel better, but the problem is they make you feel better in the moment, but not in the long run. So we want to find some healthy ones that are going to help you feel better in the moment and that are not going to be destructive to you. We don't want to have to come back and have to clean up the mess that we made when we were trying to keep ourselves safe. So again, the issue is not that we want to protect ourselves from harm or from conflict. It's not the what, but it's the how. It's how we try to do that. Because a lot of times these strategies end up doing more harm than good. Everyone has their own way of coping with and avoiding stress. And um, I think the, the last time I looked it up, there are over 40 different defense mechanisms that that we typically see. This is a big part of what 
we work through in therapy. If you've been in therapy, then you know a big part of it is in helping you see the unhealthy ways that you are coping with the stress around you. There are a lot of ways that we can cope with the stress around us. And there are a lot of unhealthy ways that we can do that as well. And the part that we don't like really is uh, in acknowledging our own defense mechanisms because sometimes in doing so we have to acknowledge the things that we hold on to like some of our vices that are kind of unhealthy for us now a lot of times we know like okay I probably shouldn't be doing this but it feels good in the moment and I don't have the capacity to 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 be more forward thinking and to make a different decision right now, or this is just my default. This is what I'm comfortable with. This is what I know. But when we put it in this terminology of this is a defense mechanism that is harmful to you, then that's going to change, or hopefully it's going to change the relationship that you have with that vice or that you have with, with that thing. Another reason why we don't always want to look at our defense mechanisms or that we, we have a hard time sometimes um, addressing or accepting the fact that we have these like destructive patterns is because in learning about your defense mechanisms, you're not only learning about the ways that you cope, but you're learning with the things that you have to cope with. So you're learning about your triggers. And when you're learning about your triggers, then that means that you are also learning about some of the trauma that you are still responding to, maybe still have not healed from. Essentially, when we're learning our triggers, we're also learning about the fear that's underneath it. If there's a fear that's beneath a trigger for you, it's one that you probably don't think about very much or that you don't consciously think about and, and deal with. It's unconscious. It's, it's under the surface. Because a lot of times we don't even know all the things that, that trigger us or we don't even know all the things that make us uh, lean into some of our defense mechanisms or some of our coping skills. There's a lack of awareness, generally speaking. We don't really have a list of all of the things. And because we don't really know how something has affected us until later. There are a lot of things that come up and it's like, wait a minute, why would that Why would that make me reach for a defense mechanism? I've, I've never thought about that thing. I never knew that, that was something that would bother me. And when you start to unpack it sometimes and you'll see, oh, well, actually, this circumstance does feel similar to another one where I was unsafe. So I guess I am trying to protect myself, but I didn't really put the pieces together. So in learning about your defense mechanisms, you're learning about your triggers. You're learning about the fears associated with your triggers. And you're learning about potential blind spots or potential trauma that you have not yet healed from. So like everything else, like we always say, it goes deeper than you think it does, which makes us want to avoid this work altogether. When you think about what it means to be on the defense, what that also implies is that there is someone on the offense. There is an opponent. There is an opposition. There's, there's some sort of threat that you have to protect yourself from. Now, sometimes that threat can be very real, right? Like if someone is chasing you, Please believe if someone's chasing me, I'm going to run. I may not get very far or very fast at all, but I'm going to try my very best, okay? Naturally, if there is a threat that I can see, then I'm going to try to defend myself against it. But other times, there are things that only feel like a threat, right? Like they're going to break up with me. They're not going to want to be my friend anymore. I'm going to get fired from my job. Those are things that feel like a threat. They feel unsafe, but there may not be any evidence to support it, but that's how it feels to you on one level or another. And so that is the threat that you may be responding to, or that is the opponent in the situation that you're trying to defend yourself against, trying to defend yourself against a feeling or an assumption or a hypothetical situation is really difficult, but we we definitely try it. We try it every single day, but that's a hard thing to do. And in my own honest reflection, I've been able to see some of my own maladaptive or unhealthy defense mechanisms. And um, there are a couple of them that I think I've been able to kind of get to the root of like, what's the fear? And then there are a couple that I'm, if I'm honest, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out or understand why I'm reaching for them or what purpose they're serving me or what they're trying to protect me from, I guess that that's a better way of saying it. But just go ahead and expose myself real quick. Some of the ones that I deal with are um, avoidance, right? I, I can be very avoidant and I have been called out about this before uh, because I don't really like conflict. Um, and sometimes I try to avoid hard things like, like a lot of people. But the moment that something starts to feel kind of arduous or it starts to feel like um, I'm having to like, I don't know, fight through a part of it or I have to fight to try to keep it, then I'm just like, 
ah, <laughs> do I really, is this really necessary? Like, do I really want to do this? But I also, I'm, I'm pretty conflict avoidant. Like I'll have hard conversations and important conversations and I'll have deep conversations, all of that. But I don't really have a lot of conflict with people. And so when that is the potential threat, I do not like it. And I try my very best to avoid it at all costs. One of the things that I think I'm pretty good at is um, I have, <laughs> I am pretty good at finding ways to say really hard things that, um, that could be, uh, that could come across as like offensive or rude or disrespectful. I have a way of saying them uh, in, in ways that, that make them land much, much softer with other people. I did. <laughs> I, I always talk about, well, not always, but one time I had, to, I, I broke up with someone and um, the way that I just like reframed and, and positioned it and presented it, it was the most amicable breakup. It was the most amicable breakup. Now, granted, I do think that we, we both were, we're not really as invested in the relationship anymore. And so on some level it was mutual, but I just remember thinking to myself, like, I just did that really, really well. We even said in the conversation, like, this is probably the nicest breakup ever, but it's because I thought so much. I thought so much and for so long about, okay, how am I going to say this so that it doesn't turn into a bigger thing or so that uh, their feelings don't get too hurt or so that they're not mad at me so that they don't hate me after this. Think about that. I'm breaking up with someone and I don't want you to like dislike me after. Why would I care about someone who I'm no longer with? Why would I care about whether or not they like me anymore? I was kind of backwards now that I'm thinking about it. But anyway, that's just an example of how I can be really avoidant sometimes because I, I don't, I don't like conflict. So avoidance is one of my defense mechanisms. And for the most part, that that can be pretty harmless, right? With like, okay, finding nice ways to say things. That's actually a really big benefit. And um, I, when, when I'm when I'm working with people, we work a lot on communication and on positive communication. And there really is something to be said for considering how what you're saying is coming across because we want it to be heard. I could go into a whole thing about how we all can probably do better about framing the things that we say so that the other person can hear it and not be offended. But in my case, one of the reasons that that developed as a skill of mine is because I'm conflict avoidant. Another one is distraction. I, yeah, I definitely fall victim to distraction and procrastination. Um, and that is, I think I have this, I don't know, it's the double-sided fear of failure, fear of, fear of success. Either way, I, 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 don't, I still don't know which one it is, but it's like, um, I'm scared to see something through because I'm scared about how it will actually go once I'm on the other side of it. So I distract myself. And so it takes me so long to start something. I'm, I'm, I'm working through it and I'm overcoming it and I'm getting better, praise God. But I have that fear at the root of that distraction. And another one is deflection. I'm so good at changing the subject, changing the topic. We talk about me one second and half a second later, we talk about you and you don't even know how it happened. Matter of fact, not even half a second later, you won't realize that it happened until like five minutes later when we've been talking about you. We've been stopped talking about me, right? And that's because I have this fear of judgment as well, this like deep rooted fear of judgment. My fellow recovering people pleasers will understand that one. But deflection is is another one. Um, yeah. Hmm. Well, in that context, yeah, that's that's the reason for the deflection. Well, Maybe, maybe in both contexts, what I'm thinking is um, that sometimes that is how I maintain my boundaries. If there are things that, um, like I don't talk about things that I'm not open to feedback about, but instead of, <laughs> see, this is the conflict avoidance, oh my gosh. But instead of saying, I'm not open to feedback about that, so I, I don't want to talk about it, I'll just change the subject. <laughs> I'll just change the subject. And you won't even really realize it. Mm. I wonder if that's good or bad. I guess it can be a little bit of both. These things are tricky like that. These ways that we cope and these ways that we try to protect ourselves, they're not 100% bad or 100% good. They're very circumstantial. Even what I'm talking about now, right? Like I'm talking about 
finding ways to communicate things so that other people's feelings are not hurt because I don't want conflict. But at the same token, like that's a really good thing because that's how that's how you can uh, make sure that eat, that that both parties are heard in a conversation. And I think that there's less like defensiveness when you operate that way, right? So it all it it comes down to your motivation behind the things that we're doing. Am I trying to find a better way to say this because I know it is a challenging topic and I want to navigate it with sensitivity or am I finding a way to say this to make sure that you're not mad at me at the end of it, right? It's a fine line sometimes and that's why these defense mechanisms can be difficult to point out. Like I really had to kind of sit with myself a little bit and uh, and and reflect a lot and think back through things and some of these came to my came to my awareness because of other people, but they're, they're not super obvious all the time. That's an important thing. I think they're not super obvious all the time. We have to know that because sometimes like, because sometimes when I'm working with clients and when I point things out to them or when I help them to see, Hey, here are some of your defense mechanisms. What I hear so often is why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I know that? It's so simple now. Now that you're saying it, of course, that's what it is. It sounds so simple. Like, duh, why couldn't I figure that out? But they're not as obvious as we think they would be or as we want them to be. And this is a part of the reason why. Because they're not always these big harmful things. The reason that some of these things can be harmful, and I guess the way that we're talking about it today, the reason that these things are harmful is that is because they perpetuate the fears that are beneath them. Me being avoidant because I don't like conflict does not absolve me from all conflict. So what it actually does sometimes is that it, it makes me struggle with internal conflict instead, right? Oftentimes, I, I question myself after an interaction with someone after a conversation with someone where I know that maybe I watered down how I truly felt about it. Right. Or, um, I don't know, you know, y'all know you've been in the shower thinking back through conversations and should have said this, should have said that, that, that happens to me a lot. And that internal conflict is maybe as bad as the external one, you know, but it does not completely absolve you or, or keep you safe from all these things that were actually trying to avoid, uh, but they do perpetuate the fear that is driving them. So they're not always very obvious. We're not always conscious of them. They're not always horrible, but they're still there. This is, this is, this is very much in the gray area. A lot of us have black and white thinking, and that makes it easier for us to compartmentalize things, but we really have to get comfortable in the gray because these things are not as black and white as we might want them to be. You have to get comfortable with the gray and you have to get you have to get comfortable with with nuance and with kind of kind of complicated approaches to things like this. Some defense mechanisms are pretty obvious and other ones just aren't. So if you if you learn about them as you go, that's a good thing. Don't be upset that you didn't learn about them earlier. Be grateful that you're learning about them now and not later. Because later you're going to learn about some other stuff. You know, like all of this is, it's it's all ongoing. It's it's ongoing. So just count yourself as, as a part of the number. We're all learning about this, myself included. Another dangerous part of these defense mechanisms is how they can really affect our faith. Now, all right, y'all go, go with me here, Okay. I have, I have these takes and these thoughts on things sometimes. And in my mind, they make a lot of sense. So just, j- just go with me. And I'm hoping that this will make sense to y'all as well. So these defense mechanisms can affect our faith because they can keep us detached from reality. What I mean by that is our defense mechanisms are the brainchild of our fears and our anxieties that we are convinced are so, so, so real. So earlier, we were talking about real versus perceived fear, right? If something feels like it's a threat or it feels dangerous, then if we sit in it enough, it's going to become very, very real to us. We convince ourselves that this is actually, in fact, a real thing. And that starts to shape 
the world around us. So we become detached from what actually is or from what we fear actually is. And there are some fears that have been with us for so, 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 so long that they do become our reality. And that's the dangerous part. When you are living in a reality or a perspective that is authored by your fears, that's an actual dangerous place to be. So many people fight incredibly hard to hold on to their defense mechanisms. Our defense mechanisms are a part of our comfort zone. We all have things that are unhealthy for us that we continue to reach for because they're familiar. And that familiarity provides us with a sense of comfort. These defense mechanisms are no different. You know how hard it is? Do you know how hard it is for me to assert, like verbally assert a boundary, I always err on the side of finding a way to enforce it without having to verbalize it, right? Um, and I I really have tried to hold on to that for so, so long because the concept of like verbally telling someone, I don't feel comfortable with that. So I'm going to govern myself in this way. Uh, <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> I, 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 I don't like it, even though I'm sure that it's necessary. I'm thinking of a situation right now where it hasn't happened yet, but I feel like the direction that it's going or the direction that it has been going, that there's going to have to be something verbalized. And I am like dreading it. The few times that it has happened, I have had to get so, so, so fed up, so much so to the point that that relationship just was not as significant to me as much anymore. And that's what made me courageous enough to like verbalize the boundary. <laughs> but the ones that I really want to keep, I feel like I don't want to say something because then it's going to be that conflict and it's just all mixed up all in there. So that's an example of how I like, I, I, I'm fighting really hard to hold on to this thing that I know probably is not healthy for me. <sighs> okay, fine, Camille. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Uh, dang. Next time. All right. Hold on. Before, before I make this commitment, <laughs> before I make, make this commitment, are there any boundaries that I feel like I need to need to verbalize? Okay. I don't feel like there are any. So I can confidently say <laughs> the next time a situation presents itself where I have a boundary that needs to be asserted, I am going to trust God to give me the strength to verbalize it instead of finding like a, a secret way to assert it. <laughs> oh Lord. All right. This was not an episode on boundaries today. That's not where I thought we were going. Maybe the Lord needs me to work through some of my boundary issues right now. We fight so hard to hold on to our defense mechanisms because in order to let them go, we have to accept the fact that we cannot change what's happening in the here and now. Our anxiety has a way of just creating this narrative and this story in our mind that feels so real. The way that I see this the most in people is worst case scenario syndrome. Everyone is so convinced that we need to be prepared for the worst case scenario. And if I asked you what is the worst case scenario, you could tell it to me in so much detail as if you've already seen it, as if it has already happened. And when I ask people this question, the answer is always the same. When I ask people, how often have you actually seen the worst case scenario that you came up with? Not how often have you seen unfavorable results? How often have you seen an outcome that didn't feel good or was not comfortable or was maybe hurtful? But how often have you seen the exact literal worst case scenario that you came up with in your mind? The answer is always never, never. But how much time do you spend thinking about that worst case scenario? You spend so much time thinking about it that it feels real as if it has already happened or as if it is somehow guaranteed to happen. And in order to let go of some of our defense mechanisms, we have to be open to the fact, or at least open to the idea that this worst case scenario that you came up with is not a real thing. That feels really scary. That feels like we're jumping without a parachute. We feel like, well, if I can prepare for the worst case scenario, then whatever happens, I'll, I'll be okay. 
as long as I don't see that that worst case scenario, which I guess in essence might be all right. But the issue comes when we spend so much time and energy thinking about the worst case scenario that we become even more fearful of moving forward. That imaginary hypothetical worst case scenario can paralyze you. I have seen it paralyze people. I have seen it paralyze people so much so that you're not taking any steps forward and in fact are taking steps backwards, going back to your comfort zone or an even unhealthier habit or pattern because at least it's not that worst case scenario that you came up with in your mind. And part of the reason that these circumstances and these fears feel so real is because a lot of times they come from our past experiences. Y'all have heard me talk about trauma a lot, and we will continue to talk about trauma because everyone has experienced it. And it's one of the leading contributors to your mental health. But our worst case scenarios and our defense mechanisms and our fears and our anxious thoughts, a lot of times are born of our negative experiences. They're born of our painful experiences which is even more reason that you ought to do the work to try to heal and overcome those past painful experiences so that they don't keep affecting you in the here and now. How do you do that, you may ask? With a licensed professional, (laughs) with a therapist. That's not to say that you cannot heal without therapy, but therapy is a really important tool and a really effective tool if it's accessible to you. So that's your therapy plug for today. Your therapy, fl- your therapy plug for today is if you've been struggling to heal from past experiences, if you have been struggling to move forward from past hurt and heartbreak, and pain, then I think that it might be worth your while to look into having someone help you try to do that work. It's hard to do it by yourself, especially when these things feel so real. They feel like they are so much, they're still so much a part of our reality in our current circumstances, in our current existence. If it feels that real to you, then you may even be under the delusion that it is real and that you don't have any need to change. I see that a whole lot too. And that's really sad. We believe the stories that our negative experiences have told us so much so that we're not even open to the fact that there might be another reality or another perspective. We might, we're we're not even open to the fact that we might be operating in a place of fear or that we might be operating out of our hurt or out of our pain. Intellectually, we know, oh yeah, no, that's not the best way to go about things. Probably shouldn't do that. (laughs) Intellectually, we know that. But psychologically, mentally, and emotionally, we don't. We don't. And that's exactly what we're doing is we're operating from that place of pain. So while on one hand, we are trying to be proactive in protecting ourselves from what might happen in the future, but in doing so, we're actually keeping ourselves stuck and tethered to the past. It's really interesting how that works, but that's what's happening a lot of the time. That paralysis, that fear that makes it that, that makes it nearly impossible or makes you feel paralyzed and you can't move forward. The fear, and you're trying to protect yourself from something bad happening because of something that something bad that happened in the past. But instead, you're actually living in the bad thing that happened in the past because you're trying to avoid it from happening in the future. (laughs) Ain't that kind of crazy? Not crazy because it's not intentional, but like that's a that's a really interesting thing when, when we put it when we put it in that way. There are so many like conflicting things, conflicting processes that are happening with us all internally. We have to voice them so that we can see them. This is one of those things. To overcome your defense mechanisms, you have to be open to the idea that your fears may not be factual. And that's, that's a really scary place to be, but that is the point that we have to get to forget about the how, but just be open to the fact that it could be a possibility that your fears only exist internally and are not real in the world around you. For me, That means being open to the idea that maybe people aren't judging every part of my life at all times. It means uh, being open to the idea that like maybe I do have what it takes to be successful long term, or maybe this disagreement won't turn into a huge argument and this person will want to leave my life forever. I have to be open to those things, but because I've been holding on to these fears for so long, saying those sentences like that doesn't even feel real like that feels like fiction because I have been operating out of these fears for so long and sometimes 
it feels safer to hold on to a fear rather than to consider walking away from it. Because if I'm walking away from it, what am I walking towards instead? Now, in this case, we're walking towards God instead. We're walking towards a different safety, a better safety that we can trust. Because if we're leaning on our own devices, the safety that we're trying to provide is the one that is holding you captive to your past. So that's what you're walking away from. Be open to walking away from that captivity, right? Of being so tethered to your past that you have allowed it to author an alternative reality that's authored by those fears that you're living in now. Be open to walking away from that captivity and into freedom. Well, when you put it that way, it don't sound so scary. But who do you think is happy about you still being captive to your past? The devil. That's right. That's right. He wants you to stay back there. He don't want you to move forward. <laughs> and this is where the spiritual warfare comes into play. Remember we said that if you're on the defense, then there's there must be an opponent. Who do you think the opponent is? 10 points if you said the devil. That's who wants to keep you attached to your maladaptive defense mechanisms. He don't want no progress, no progress at all. And in order to have a good defense, we need to know a little bit about our opponent. Now, the good thing is this is not a new opponent. <laughs> this is the same opponent who has been around since the beginning of time. This chick is getting kind of old if you ask me, but he's, he's sticking to it. He's committed to it. This is the opponent that has been around for a long time. So we already know a little bit about him. We already know a bit about his tactics and that is good for us. He's, he's lazy in the, in the sense that he uses the same tactic every time. The main tactic that the enemy uses is deception. And that can look a lot of different ways. It's not just looking like he's telling a blatant lie. It's not just that. That would be too easy to catch. But this deception is really sneaky, right? The word tells us that he walks around like a lion, roaming around seeking whom he may devour. Think about the way that a lion stalks their prey. It's sneaky, it's quiet, trying not to be seen, not to be caught, trying to blend in with the surroundings. That's how he works, that's how this deception works. The Bible says that he is deceitful and there is no truth in him. In Revelation, he's referred to as the accuser. Like this is what we know about the enemy. This is how we identify him. He has no boundaries and no respect. He takes no issue, no issue in weaponizing your trauma. So to you, it feels like you're trying to keep yourself safe, but actually he's using what happened to you to keep you tethered to it. And that's the driving force behind a lot of our defense mechanisms. Our opponent does not play fair. And we really have to remember that he don't play fair. He does not play fair. In a rule book, he's just out here causing chaos, okay? Just chaos, left and right. He does not play fair. He does not respect you. He doesn't respect your boundaries. He doesn't respect what else you have going on in your life. He don't respect what you're trying to do. None of that. And he goes below the belt, okay? Weaponizing your trauma and the things that have happened to you to make it so that you feel like you cannot rely on God, that's, that, that's below the belt if you ask me. But it's, it, it keeps happening because it's so effective. So we really have to increase our, our, our understanding of the ways that we have to guard ourselves against him because he's like really cunning and creative. So we have to be as creative in our defense. Remember we said that defense mechanisms are all about safety from either a real or perceived threat. Think about that perceived threat for a second. That means that we'll see a threat when there's not actually one there. In other words, we are being deceived hmm, to believe that there is a threat or something that is dangerous in our surroundings when there may not be. And we are operating out of that deception. We're allowing it to dictate what we do, how we move, what's important, what's not important. We're being deceived into seeing and believing that we're in danger when maybe we're actually not. And most of the time, it's in our mind. You may not be having hallucinations and seeing things and hearing things that aren't there, but 
this perceived danger or this perceived threat is internal. It's in your mind. And that would be fine if it just stayed there. If it just stayed in your mind, it didn't affect you anywhere else. But our mind is connected to our heart and our heart is connected to our spirit. So contamination might start in the mind, but it's going to get to the spirit. Contamination might start in the mind, but if we let it, it'll, it'll creep into your heart. And then from there, right on into your spirit. The enemy attacks the mind in hopes that the heart will follow right behind it. He's playing chess, not checkers. So he starts by deceiving you into believing that there is a, a threat or a danger. And he does this by weaponizing our trauma. And then that perceived threat or danger creates a belief, a, a, a core belief that we hold in our heart and that we use to guide us and to be our compass in the way that we navigate through this world. So now our compass and our guiding force is not God and his word. Instead, it is this fear that is birthed of your trauma and of your past experiences. Isn't that kind of mind blowing? It, it, it is to me, but that's, that's kind of mind blowing that that's, it gets that deep that the thing that is guiding you, the thing that's guiding the steps that you make in life, the thing that's guiding your decisions could potentially be deception. We hope not. <laughs> we hope not. But if we're not careful, that's exactly what's happening, which is even more reason for us to try our best to detach from some of these defense mechanisms and to be present enough in what's happening in the here and now to deal with it instead of living in this hypothetical worst case scenario. When you allow these maladaptive defense mechanisms to enter into your heart, the other thing that they do is that they draw you further and further away from God and closer to your own understanding. Now, we already know what's, what's going to happen when you lean on your own understanding. Leaning on your own understanding will always lead you to this battle between logic and faith. Our minds find comfort in logic because... If I can understand something, then I probably have a better chance at predicting it. And if I can predict something, then I probably have a better chance at controlling it. And if I can control something, then that means that I can probably dictate the outcome of it. And if I can dictate the outcome, then maybe that means that I can make sure that I don't see a painful outcome. That's, that's what happens. That's the thought process when we lean on our own understanding. And that is the thought process that gives us comfort. Somehow we convince ourselves that we will be able to control the outcome and that we'll be able to avoid any negative outcomes. So leaning on our own understanding makes us rely on ourselves for safety and protection and for deliverance instead of relying on God for those things. The intellectual instinct is to protect yourself instead of asking and allowing God to protect you. And really, who's more capable? It ain't me. Truly, it's not. But my own understanding, my own human logic will tell me that I have the capacity to keep myself safe from any kind of hurt or pain or danger or threat. Or that I am able to avoid any conflict that looks like a conflict that I had to face before that I didn't really like. That just ain't true. When we, when we convince ourselves that we're the only ones who can keep us safe, in that moment, we believe that we are more trustworthy than God and that it's safer to lean on our own understanding than on his. I think part of the difficulty in leaning on God's understanding is that we can't comprehend his understanding or his knowledge or his logic or any of that. His thoughts are above our thoughts, always have been, always will be. It's hard to lean on something that you don't have all the information about. But that, my friends, is, is what we call faith. Okay? Come on, somebody. That's faith. Faith is leaning on God's understanding instead of yours. Faith is leaning on God's understanding even though you may not be able to fathom what it is that he's doing or why he's doing it. Leaning on his, on his understanding when it don't make no sense to you. That's faith. Deceit will always 
pull you away from God. It will always put distance between you and God. And that's why the weapons that we have to fight this spiritual warfare, the weapons and the tactics that we have are created to keep us close to God. Because deceit and leaning on our own understanding, the purpose of that is to separate us from God. The enemy is always trying to separate us from God. So by doing your due diligence, you're doing all the things to keep you close to God, to keep you connected to him, to keep you coming back to him. These weapons are, when you think about it that way, they're not to uh, defeat the enemy. That's already been done. He's already been defeated. But these weapons and these tools that we have are for our own protection and that they keep us close to God. They keep us close to the victor. They keep us close to the champ. (laughs) I'm trying to be as close to the champ as I possibly can be. Right. And that's, that's my understanding of the tools that are available to us. The weapons are available to us. The ones that are divinely powerful, they're divinely powerful because they keep us tethered to the divine. Okay. They keep us close enough to hear him. They keep us close enough to trust him. They keep us close enough to just let him work because the battle is simply not yours. Okay. And it has already been won. So we need to stay close enough to God to always keep that truth at the forefront. The battle is not mine to win. It has already been won. It's not up to me to keep myself safe. I couldn't if I tried. There are always going to be painful experiences. There's always going to be trials. The enemy is always going to be deceitful. He's always going to be planting seeds of doubt and seeds of deceit. And if I allow those seeds to grow, then they're only going to cause more of a chasm in my relationship with God. They're only going to put more distance between he and I. And that's going to make it difficult for me to stay obedient. I need to stay close enough to God to stay obedient to him. Even when I don't understand what he's doing or why he's doing it, what it is that he wants me to do or why he wants me to do it. I need to stay close enough to be obedient regardless. Okay. Blind obedience. That's what I'm after. So I know now you're asking, all right, Camille, well, what are those tools? What helps you stay close to God? I think that's a question that I hope you sit with. Pull out your journal. That's that's our reflection question. What helps you stay close to God? The the greatest resources that that God has given us aside from his son is his holy spirit and his word. We have everything that we need for life and godliness with those tools, with those resources. The way that we use those resources is different for everyone, and that's the question for you to sit with. How do you initiate and use those tools? How do you use those resources to stay close to God? What does that look like for you? For me, it looks like constant prayer and I'm talking constant, okay? Once that verse about praying without ceasing comes real to you, once that becomes real, then you'll know exactly what I mean. Constant prayer, dedicated, quiet time. Let me tell you, in my apartment that I have now, I have a prayer closet. It's the first time that I've had one and I feel like I can't go back. Even if wherever I go next doesn't have its its own like separate enclosed prayer space, I need to have a space that is that is uh, separated, that is holy, that is for me and God alone. Because that prayer closet is my favorite place in this house, okay? Having that dedicated quiet time, that dedicated alone time with God is immensely important for me. Having more in-depth Bible study, right? More than, uh, more than, more than just the devotionals on my phone, which I still use the more in-depth Bible study, going deeper into the word and gaining a new level of understanding. You know, you, we heard, we hear people talk about the fact that you can read a verse that you've heard your entire life and you read it again for the like 50th time and you get a whole new meaning out of it. So that in-depth Bible study has been really, really crucial for me too. Fasting. Someone asked about uh, spiritual fasting. I think I mentioned it in a in a past um, episode, but the reason that it is so helpful for me and what I believe it's, is its purpose is that when you are fasting from something, traditionally it's food, uh, when you're fasting from something, what you're actually doing is denying the flesh. You're denying the flesh something that it really wants in order to hear more from the spirit, in order to gain clarity 
in order to gain spiritual clarity. We have to die to ourselves every day, but that kind of constant and in the moment denial of self forces you to turn to something that is stronger than your flesh, which is the spirit. And so doing that for an extended and prolonged period of time has been so fruitful for me. Every time I fast, I, I, I come out of it with some sort of revelation and I come out of it feeling closer to God. So that's a, a regular part of my spiritual practice as well. Repentance, okay? R- r- repentance, right? When God, when God shows you yourself, when God has shown me myself, my immediate posture is repentance. It's gratitude and repentance. Thank you, God, for showing me myself. Forgive me, God, for all the ways that I was before you showed me myself. Forgive me for what I didn't know. Forgive me for operating out of fear. Forgive me for doing whatever it is and help me to not do it again. Because when you're asking God to come in and like purify you and renew you, you're asking him to show you yourself and you're asking him to show you your your missteps. You're asking him to show you your sin. So when he shows you your sin, the next step, the next posture is repentance. I'm trying to be better with my memory verses. I have seasons with this when I go in and out of it, but I have an app on my phone. I think it's called Bible Memory. I have an app on my phone uh, that helps me with memory verses. And um, sometimes I try to use that instead of the games on my phone. I don't have storage on my phone for a lot of games anyway. Uh, so sometimes I'll delete all the games off my phone, but I just have my memory, my memory verse app. And when I feel like I want to go and do something uh, mindless, and it's, it's, it's not mindless, but um it feels like a game a little bit, but that has helped me really to uh, etch etch the word of God on my heart and to really keep it close to me and to keep it at the forefront of my mind and to really declare it in moments of that spiritual warfare. So that's huge. Having a spiritual community, my goodness, it is just priceless and so necessary. I am so grateful for the spiritual community that I have found and am finding since I've moved to Houston. I've always had some sort of a spiritual community uh, and my family has been a big part of that as well. And in this move, that was a big part of my prayer was that God would lead me to a church home where I would really be able to find that sense of community. And he has answered that prayer tenfold. And I'm I'm so, 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 so grateful. Um, if you haven't listened to my episode on adult friendships and, and community, um, then go back and listen to it because I talk more about why that is so important. That kind of goes into like, you know, regular church attendance and being active and just like really just working in the kingdom, working for the kingdom. These are all ways that are harness the strength that we have through the Holy Spirit and through the word of God. Over the years, these things I just listed have been so crucial to my self-care, honestly, because it's been it, because it has become that much more important to me that I stay close to God, that I stay close to him at all times. When I'm feeling off kilter or off balance in any other area of my life, this is where I go first. And that's why I say it's a part of my self-care. Before I get back in the gym, I get back in the prayer closet. Before I get back on my skincare routine, I get back on my Bible study routine. Before I go and get a massage, I go to church. Like that is how I recenter. That is how I make sure that I'm well. That's how I stay prepared to fight in this spiritual warfare by always staying close to God. Our enemy does not take any time off. Spiritual warfare is constant. The battle in the spirit is always happening. There is no day off. They don't have no holiday time, no PTO, none of that. It's literally always happening and always going on, which means that my spiritual activity needs to also always be going on. That means that I need to always be strengthening myself spiritually so that I can be prepared. The way that I do that is by staying close to God. Okay. I need to always be staying close to God so that I'm always ready to fight whatever attacks the enemy is throwing my way. And he is going to keep throwing them my way. I'm telling y'all. And the more that I try to work for God, then the the warfare just keeps coming in, in newer and newer ways. So for me, as for me in my house, Okay. It is, it's, it's so important that I stay, I stay prayed up and I stay fluent with all of these spiritual practices. And I'm always trying to add more things to this list too. Okay. Because the tactics are getting more and more creative. The root is always deception, but the way that that's coming, it's just really, it's, it's y'all please take my word for it. We have to we, we we have to stay ready for for warfare and 
what we're talking about it, the way that we are talking about it and thinking about it now is probably not the way that we typically talk about it. We think about it and talk about it in a lot of different ways, you know, like when we don't feel like talking to God anymore, when we find it hard, when we find it hard to pray, when we have um, impure thoughts. And those are all spiritual warfare. Absolutely. Those are some of the more obvious ones. Those are some of the ones that we are more aware of. So we're, we're, we're on guard for those, right? We can kind of see those coming. What we're talking about today are the tactics that we don't see coming. You probably don't think about your avoidance and deflection as a form of spiritual warfare, but it absolutely can be. And we have to be aware and alert enough and willing to work through that enough so that the devil don't have a, a leg to stand on, so that he doesn't have as much fertile ground in that area. The Bible talks about good soil and fertile ground, right? Because there are seeds that are being planted. There are lots of different kinds of seeds that are being planted. And so if you're not doing the work to do that pruning, then those seeds that the enemy is planting, they're, they're, they're falling on fertile ground and they're going to produce a type of fruit that is going to just contaminate the rest of what you have going on. And he's going to be pleased with that. And you're going to be suffering because of it. So that is my encouragement that you, that you are courageous enough to be willing to do the work, to do the pruning, to stay close to God, to stay on guard, to stay alert, to be ready to fight in the spirit because the war is going to keep happening whether you're ready for it or not. Okay. So stay ready. So you ain't got to get ready. Amen. All right. That's going to lead us into our scripture for the day. Very, very well-known passage is well-known because it's true. First Peter 5, 8 through 9 says, Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. We've heard this, this verse over and over and over again, it is a reminder to stay vigilant and alert about what's happening in our subconscious, what's happening in the mind, because it's connected to what's happening in the spirit, right? Remember that the mind and the heart and the spirit, remember that they're all connected. So it's not only about being alert with what's happening spiritually, it's also being alert with what's happening with you mentally, because it's going to have an impact. It's always going to have an impact. It's not the most obvious things that pose the biggest threat to our salvation. It is in the small subtleties that we thought we forgot about or pushed down or haven't looked at in a while. And we think they don't affect us anymore. Those pose the biggest threat to us. So we have to do the hard work of paying attention to the ugly parts that we want to hide and that we want to hide from. Because while you're not paying attention to it, the devil is squatting there. He's establishing residency in your trauma, in your darkness. He's establishing residency there. So you have to be willing to go to some of those places, to go to some of those places and and, and clean them out so that he don't have nowhere else to squat, okay? Okay, so wrapping it up, we have our listener question of the week. Just as a reminder, if you have a question that you want to be answered on the show, please send me an email at therapyandprayer at gmail.com. Send me a DM. Uh, We are on Instagram, TikTok, at Therapy and Prayer. You can uh, drop a question in the comments here on YouTube or wherever you're listening to this so that it can be answered on the show. Today's question, do you have any advice for identifying Satan's efforts before someone falls to those efforts? I think that my short answer to this um, is that I have, uh, I think, two, two things to be aware of. Number one, get familiar with God's voice. Get familiar with God's voice so that you can recognize when it's a voice other than God's. Get familiar with God's voice so that you can hear it through those negative thought patterns and thought processes that we talked about. The second is get familiar with your own blind spots because that is where the devil works the most. The places where you're not paying attention, the places that you suppress or think don't affect you anymore. So I would say we have to start with those two things, getting familiar with God's voice, getting familiar with your blind spots. Those blind spots can also be negative patterns. We all have negative patterns that keep showing up for us. 
Y'all know for me is my procrastination. I'm working through it. Okay. Praise God. But that is a pattern for me. And I'm learning to be even more diligent and on alert when I feel the urge to procrastinate and listening for God's voice in that. God's voice is not the one who's telling me, yeah, go ahead and keep putting that thing off till tomorrow. Right. So I'm having to really be alert in that way. Um, so what negative patterns kind of keep showing up for you? He's going to show up in those, in those similar ways. So if I could use a sports analogy real quick, <laughs> this is funny because if you know me, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not a sports person very much. Not at all. Sports and I, we don't, we don't have a very good relationship, but what I do know is that sometimes they sit and watch back the tapes and they look at the plays, they look at what their opponent did. That's what we have to do as well, right? A good way to do this is by writing down your prayers and by really documenting your journey with God, because you're going to see all of the ways and all the times that he continues to protect you and to deliver you and to uplift you. And in those instances where he's protecting and delivering and uplifting you, there's been an opponent. He's protecting you from something that could have taken you out. He's uplifting you from being, being down and being disheartened and being heartbroken right? He is um, delivering you from some sort of stronghold. So start documenting your journey with God, writing down your prayers and really being intentional about acknowledging the ones that he has already answered. In most places where you can see God, you can probably also see the devil, unfortunately, (laughs) but that's what he's threatened by. And he's always trying to take it out. So Get familiar with God's voice so that you can hear when he is speaking to you and when you can hear when he's not, when it's another voice other than his. Get familiar with your own blind spots and your negative patterns because that is where the devil is going to keep showing up and keep trying to attack you where he's been successful before. And third, start documenting your journey with God, your walk with the Lord so that you can see and be your own witness as to how he has protected and delivered you. And that's also going to show you maybe some of those patterns about the ways that the devil is continuing to attack you. And then actually I want to add a fourth. The fourth is get you a battle buddy, get you a battle buddy, get you a community, find some like-minded people who are also intentionally fighting the same battle because there are power, there, there's power in numbers and y'all can, y'all can fight together. We're stronger together than we are apart. Okay. All right. Mm, I think that was good. (laughs) I hope that was good. That's all that I have for you all. Uh, I hope and pray that you were able to take something from it and that it has encouraged you. Um, Stay on alert this week, friends, because the, the battle is ongoing. All right. I love you so much. Thank you for being here. I will talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of Therapy and Prayer. Make sure you're subscribed and following wherever you listen to podcasts. And if the spirit moves you, go ahead and leave us a review. If you want to submit a question to be answered on this show, send us an email at therapyandprayer at gmail.com. And make sure you're following us on TikTok at Therapy and Prayer. Thanks again for listening. I'll talk to you soon.